recording the this meeting is being recorded all right oh good morning everyone my name is Lori Benales and I'm the executive director here at Alta California Regional Center I want to welcome you to our second um, of two uh, annual meetings that we're hosting this year uh, related to our POS data uh, our first one was on Monday evening and we had a nice crowd of individuals and we started the conversation you know about you know input from the community around the areas that we may enhance uh, to get uh, different outcomes related to the data. Uh, we have staff that have spent a great deal of time combing through the 55 plus pages of data this year uh, and looking at it in a comparative way against uh, previous years so that we could get a good glimpse uh, of progress in areas where we still are looking to enhance. Uh, we waited till the end of March to do these two meetings. We had until the uh, last day of March uh, uh, through statutorial requirements to get these meetings on. Uh, the calendar. And the reason was we were working uh, as a regional center, we have put before our board a board policy on service access and equity. And we felt that that was really important to have in place and have board approved policy before we came to this meeting. Uh, we wanted to state that we are proactively looking to engage um, our agency across all of the areas that intersect with client services around service access and equity. Uh, our board uh, last Thursday night at the board meeting approved our policy uh, and we have that now as the legs or the foundation of how we move forward in our organization. Everything from how we look to hire uh, the individuals under the language access and the reflection of our communities, uh, looking at training, uh, looking at the vendorization process and what we need in terms terms of the reflection of our community uh, in the services that we bring forward as well. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you. Uh, additionally, um, I'm going to kick it over to Michelle Johnson. She is our Director of Client Services. Uh, both uh, Herman Kothi, who will be presenting the second portion of this uh, data to you, and Helen Neary, who is our uh, Culture Diversity Specialist. She'll do the front end of the presentation. Uh, they both report to Michelle, and she's had some strong leadership in helping to get this presentation together. So without further ado, I'll kick it over to Michelle to introduce the two of them. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy morning to come and spend with us. And um, as we present on the annual discussion of services to our diverse community, I want to introduce Herman Kothi, who is our training manager. He just waved his hand. And I want to introduce Helen Neary, who is our cultural diversity specialist. The two of them will be walking us through the data this morning. Again, thanks for your uh, time and we look forward to a discussion. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and uh, if you'll give us one moment, we're still trying to uh, get our second uh, recording uh, set up. Um, so uh, Ryan in the Spanish channel, uh, who's probably only hearing a Spanish translation, um, if you could attempt to record and that will hopefully ask the host to give you permission and Helen if you could uh, try to find a way to grant Ryan that permission so we can capture the uh, Spanish language recording. Ryan, can you unmute yourself so I can hear you? Ryan's in the uh, Spanish language channel. Oh. So, uh, okay, so I have to, let me just go real quickly to the Spanish channel. He can't go to the English channel, Herman. Uh, someone would need to tell him to do that, uh, and he's only hearing Spanish uh, at the moment. So I can hear you in between the uh, translations, but I still don't have permission to record. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, maybe I need to click on Ryan's name. Herman, can I make you co-host or no? Uh, that'll give me a different perspective, but uh, we can give that a try. Okay. Let me just give... 
Let me just stop sharing so I can see Herman. Okay. Make co host. Okay. So hopefully you can help me with uh, making Ryan, allowing Ryan to record in Spanish. All right. All right, Ryan, that permission should be granted. And Helen, if you'd like to share your screen and uh, get our PowerPoint uh, in slideshow mode, we'll go ahead and get started. Confirm. <laughs> I, I've got it now. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Okay. So uh, once again, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us in this collaborative process. Uh, we appreciate you uh, lending your time. Um, as we get into the portion of today's meeting that will be uh, the presentation of information, uh, I wanna begin by taking a look at the reason we're here today. Uh, so reviewing our purchase of service expenditures is required by the law, and we will certainly satisfy that legislative mandate of examining the data uh, that was compiled in a uniform manner, as well as taking a look at um, some of the ways that we dug a little deeper into our own um, regional centers uh, purchase of service expenditures. Uh, so we do plan to focus on data that's most relevant to our community. And most importantly, uh, the sharing of information is the baseline, uh, but the stakeholder input, the opportunity for you to share with us uh, is the real value of why we're here today. As many of you know, regional centers were designed intentionally to be responsive to the needs of the communities they serve. And this is our opportunity to hear from you about the direction we wanna go in the future. So as we go through this, please be thinking about areas of service accessibility that you might like to take a closer look at, uh, what questions haven't been asked that we could be asking to help us understand why disparities exist, and what ideas or solutions uh, you would like to see developed uh, to address areas where we can improve uh, based on the information that we do know, that we do have. Um, I'll share uh, one of my roles here at the Regional Center is also working with our social work student interns. We currently have eight uh, from a variety of universities. And there are nine core competencies in the profession of social work, regardless of which university our students come to us from. Uh, they have learning agreements that focus on areas of professional development in these core competencies. And one of those areas is research-informed practice and practice-informed research, the cyclical nature of gathering information and uh, being responsive uh, to um, service delivery with the knowledge that that provides. And I think this process that we have here today is the best example that our system has of conducting research, gathering information, and using that to impact service delivery at a system level. Uh, so with that, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Alta's cultural diversity specialist, Helen Neary, uh, to share with us some of the great work uh, that has been accomplished, uh, that is still underway, or is on the horizon with some of the new uh, approved service access and equity grant projects uh, that the department um, funds. All right, so thank you, Herman. Um, so for uh, Alta's grant, a disparity grant project, we had uh, two projects that um, one had just been completed and one that's still ongoing. So we completed our service navigator program for uh, grant year 1920. This program served a total of 42 clients. 24 were Hispanic, four, 14 were African-American and uh, four were uh, Slavic clients. Now this is a second cycle grant for Service Navigator. The first Service Navigator program was uh, approved in 2017 and that uh, was a two year grant and then we continued it on to uh, 1920 until uh, 2022. And um, this grant, the 1920 grant 
was successful in helping our families navigate uh, technology. Uh, our, the navigators help the families set up their emails, navigate websites of um, social service agencies like SSI, IHSS, Medi-Cal. And they also help with transition uh, from early start to lanterman services or uh, to school district services. Uh, unlike the first cycle of uh, service navigator, um, that was pre-pandemic. So the activities that we completed in the first uh, service navigator grant uh, was kind of different from the 1920 service navigator grant. But nevertheless, um, the 1920 uh, service navigator was instrumental in helping families with technology and the website navigation. And the second um, grant project that we're still working on is the 2021 video module. The goal that we have for this um, project is we want the videos to be a conversation starter for families. You know, our SCs are not always able to go out and explain to families all of the services that we have available. And uh, having these video modules um, are going to be important, you know, so that the SCs can leave them with the families and hopefully the families can, can um, view these videos, which are going to be available in uh, YouTube. And um, that will encourage them to ask about the service, what is residential services, you know, what is ILS. What, so these video modules are going to be the introduction of uh, the service that we have uh, that will be available for our families. We are on track to finish about six uh, English videos right now. And um, the, there will be a total of 24 videos. It's gonna be in English, eight English, eight uh, uh, English, Spanish, and uh, Hmong. And uh, the services that are listed here are the ones that uh, we're featuring in the, the modules, ABA day program, residential services, ILS, DME, supported employment, and self-determination. Um, if I uh, did not mention anything else, that it's respite also. And I'd like to show you guys a, a sample of uh, the video that has been completed. Uh, this is a three and a half uh, minute video. Uh, and I'm only going to show about two minutes of it. Um, but it will show you uh, what the video is like and um, the SCs that participated as well as the clients that were featured in the, in the video. So Helen, we're still seeing the uh, thumbnail view of the PowerPoint oh, presentation. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I need to. I know what I need to do. Now throughout the year, she's a part of our village. I need to stop the sharing first, and then share. Okay. Okay, and let me go back and share my screen again. And can you see that screen now? Yeah, we're now seeing the- All right, great, route. okay. So durable medical equipment is just anything that can benefit the client at home in the community, just make them a little bit more independent across environments. We've recently moved to Sacramento. It hasn't been a full two years yet. So we're still learning a lot of uh, navigating a lot of different programs and things for Nina. And Nina is a very lively, energetic 
little one who just loves dolls and puzzles and games and yeah, mama. <laughs> we don't really use a lot of services. For the most part, it's the IEP help, the medical ID bracelet, working on getting her a new pediatric stroller, that type of thing. If I have a process question that, that deals with medical equipment or school, the first person I will call is typically Maria, and then she'll help me with the steps on what I need to do next. So the first um, step I would say to family is to reach out to the service coordinator and, um, you know, share the needs of the clients. Um, and as a service coordinator, we will provide a support for the family on ways to get that uh, durable medical equipment and we'll guide the family along the way. So I'm mom, this is a writer. She is nine years old and we live uh, here in the Sacramento area, Antelope. Um, she was diagnosed at about 18 months with autism and it's uh, been sort of a journey ever since. Um, I can't remember how I got connected with Alta, um, but I, I was so grateful because I'm a single mom. And once she was diagnosed, um, she was approved to get speech, occupational therapy, and also um, ABA. All very expensive. All right, so that's about uh, two minutes of the, the video that we have. So let me just, uh, and um, I know we have a lot of essays that are here with us today. I'd like to appeal to all of the essays that are here to uh, help us with our recruitment of clients for the remaining videos that uh, we need to complete. Like I said, um, we have, we're on track to finish um, six of them in English. We still need uh, ABA services in English. We need client participants for that. We also need a supported employment. And, um, and we prefer that if you have an African-American client that you think will be good for these videos uh, to please call me. Uh, I think that the only thing that I would ask the essays to do is to start the conversation with the families and then I will take it from there. Um, for Spanish and Hmong, we have day program already. We have ABA services in Spanish. For Hmong, we have ILS and residential service. And then for the rest, we don't have anyone yet. So please, if you can help us, I would greatly appreciate it. You see the, the video, it's beautifully made and the essays did a fabulous and then the clients that were beautiful. So just a, a, a recruitment. All right, so moving on, can you guys see my screen? All right. No. No, okay, I need to reshare again. Let's see and go back to our slideshow. Okay, so, um, so these are a list of the community-based organizations that were granted uh, grant funding for this year. Um, DDS approved them and some of them have has had a grant uh, project since previous years, and they worked with us in their uh, previous grant project. And uh, the project was continued for 21-22, and that's why they're on this list. The only one that's not that doesn't have a, a continuing grant project in this list is Warmline. I included them because they were our partner since 2017 for our uh, service navigator program. Their grant also ended in uh, February of, of this year. So HYPU, Hmong Youth and Parents United, uh, Love Hmong Center is a um, CBO that was approved by, uh, for a grant previously with Central Valley Regional Center for their 21-22, they're expanding to Bali Mountain Regional Center and Alta's catchment area, as well as uh, Central Valley's catchment area. Level Up NorCal, we've 
work with them since 2021. Uh, they're doing outreach to the Southeast Asian communities. Uh, California Hands and Voices and Norco Services for Deaf and Hard of Hearing have been approved to work with our deaf and hard of hearing population. And um, last Monday, we uh, were privileged to have HYPU in Level Up NorCal talk to us about the, the projects that they've, they've done. Uh, today, we actually have uh, Nancy Sager for California Hands and Voices to talk about their uh, recently approved grant project. So Nancy, I'm gonna uh, give it over to Nancy. Nancy, if you can unmute yourself. And I, I am unmuted, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so the, um, I, I wanna thank you for inviting me to attend this um, conference or the, this meeting. Um, but I want to tell you that the objective of California Hands and Voices, um, it was actually the ASTRA program, which is, stands for Advocacy, Support, and Training, um, the grant Promoting Services, at, Services, Access, and Equity Grant for Children Who Are Deaf Plus, um, will be provided, will be, will be to provide deaf-led and parent-led training to regional center staff and parents to empower parents to seek appropriate language acquisition services for their children who are deaf plus. So all trainings will focus on ensuring that all deaf children have access to parent support and to deaf coaches and training will be focused on language acquisition viewed through the lens of the language milestones developed by the SB 210 committee. So California Hands and Voices is a community-based organization which offers parents um, connections and support to families of deaf and hard of hearing children, regardless of whether the families have chosen to raise their deaf and hard of hearing children with spoken languages or the dual language of ASL and spoken language. The, according to the California Department of Education, 40% of deaf and hard of hearing children are deaf plus, and California Hands and Voices serves them in all capacities. But here's the kicker, is that solely low incidence deaf and hard of hearing children are served by the LEAs under the auspices of the California Department of Education and deaf plus children are served by regional center and they have different um, codes that, re that regulate them. So California education code requires that deaf and hard of hearing children be served by a teacher of the deaf and that services be provided once or twice a week. And that is not true in the regional center and that is why we wrote this grant. So in 2016, SB 210, Senate Bill 2010, required that all deaf and hard of hearing children be assessed by the desired results and by the sky high. Um, and the committee developed the, what was called language milestones and they are on the California Department of Education website. However, this law did not apply to deaf plus children who are being served by regional centers and they are birth to three. So the grant calls for three if activities. Um, it, re it requires that two Spanish speaking ASTRA advocates be, um, be hired and trained. It requires that develop um, it requires us to develop short videos about working with deaf and hard of hearing kids and to distribute them. And here's the important part is to provide trainings. And we were going to start at the trainings. We, we wrote our grant to cover all 21 regional centers. Our timeline, our time frame was cut in half 
from 24 months to 12 months. Um, however, our money stayed almost the same. Um, it's about more than $99,000. So we are not positive we are going to complete all of the trainings, but we are going to start at the trainings like Alta Regional that has a deaf, um, deaf specialist, a deaf specialist who is themselves deaf. So we, um, we are going to provide training in We Are Hands and Voices, in Deaf with Dignity, and um, Kristen Stratton is a parent who has, she is hard of hearing herself, and she has two hard of hearing sons, and one is deaf plus and is served by the regional center. Um, Julie Remsmario will come, will um, part, will participate in the trainings, and she will do focus on deaf culture, deaf community cultural wealth, and then Sherry Farina, who um, funds the who leads the Lead K organization, um, will focus on SB 210. And so I will also focus on SB 210. So our goal is to collaborate with your deaf specialist um, on the trainings and the follow-up activities of that. So um, do you have any questions? Any questions, everyone? All right. All right, thank you so much, Nancy. We look You're forward welcome. to collaborating. I'm sure I'll be working with Rima as well on this oh, grant project. I'm very excited about that, yeah. All right, thank you. So should I, um, should I um, call off and leave the meeting right now? Oh, oh, what's that, Nancy? Sorry. Should I leave the meeting? Oh, no, it's up to you. You can stay or... Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, this slide talks about the gains that the um, projects, disparity grant projects have uh, made over the last five years. So, you know, um, we have been implementing the grant projects for about five years now, and uh, many other regional centers, for example, the Service Navigator Program and the Promotora Program, it's the same concept. They're um, assistance provided to the ethnically diverse communities in navigating resources from the regional center or, or from Medi-Cal, SSI, IHSS. Um, that, program has been instrumental in helping our uh, communities that are struggling with language barrier, cultural barriers, and just navigating a complex system, regional center or Medi-Cal or IHSS. As a result of that, the uh, Welfare Institutions Code 4519.9 has been instituted. It means that it is now in the law, the Community Navigator Program, and it's funded is going to be available uh, statewide to um, all populations of the development of disability system. You know, throughout the years, uh, regional centers have implemented a cultural competency, sensitivity, proficiency trainings. Others have done implicit bias training that has resulted in welfare in institutions code 4511.1 which is the ongoing implicit bias training. And what we've been told is that there could be other uh, trainings provided the implicit bias, but uh, that means funding is available uh, for regional centers staff uh, to have the implicit bias training. Translation services, Alta had a translation grant in 2016-17 and that is instrumental, it's really important because according to ARCA's uh, records or, or documentation, the development of disability system has 24 ethnicities. That was in 2015, I'm sure it's more now if there's an updated report. 24 ethnicities and 45 spoken languages all throughout California. 
and so that translation, uh, which resulted to uh, Welfare and Institutions Code 4620.4, which is Language Access and Cultural Competency Initiative, is uh, funding for the system, you know, for ongoing translation services. Um, an opportunity for our website to be more friendly to our uh, diverse communities. The Enhanced Caseload is a project implemented by East LA Regional Center that has resulted in uh, amendment of the contract between DDS and the 21 regional centers for allowing a, or extra funding for an enhanced caseload, one to 40. That was the ELARCH project with in, instrumental in increasing the services of the ethnically diverse communities. And all of the grant making activities around the state are, are now going to be subjected to an independent evaluation by a professional agency, which is what we want to have because we want to, to see that these grant projects are uh, effective. But, you know, granted, the, what we see right now in the legislation and all the funding that we're getting as a result of the project. I think we're on the right track. Um, for 2021, we did um, the performance contract activities that we have engaged in. The list that you see here are community partners that we have. Um, we do expanded outreach with them. We work together with some of them. And probably in the future, we'll be working with them to conceptualize grant projects designed for our uh, diverse communities. Um, this list is not exhaustive. It's going to continue to expand as we continue to connect with our community partners. Uh, I'd like to point out, for example, uh, the Muslim American Society Social Services Foundation. We just started connecting with them but they serve a lot of the uh, Afghan refugees in Sacramento. So that's a resource that's going to be important for us as we um, have more uh, ref refugees um, into our, our system. And also for the uh, performance contract activities, we work with Disability Rights of California in 2021 to provide all the trainings that are listed here. Medical, IHSS, SSI, Special Education, CalABLE, and the training uh, videos are, are available in our YouTube channel. And at Alta, we also have case managers that are uh, that go out into the community to provide education on general overview of services, ACRC services, also about about our intake and eligibility processes. And for 2021, we conducted a total of like 27 uh, outreach, 25 by the two other communities like SCOE, Aetna, CSUS, and two were provided to HYPU um, staff. We did two in-person outreach for 2021, only two, the Aloha Festival and Mini Sacramento Mall New Year. Um, we Previously, pre-pandemic, there were many more outreach activities that we did. But in 2021, because of the pandemic, we only did two. So specific activities for service access and equity promotion for Alta were vendoring a promotora program. Because of the success of the service navigator program, we want to make sure that this program continues to be available to our uh, uh, ethnically diverse community. Those uh, families that struggle with cultural barriers and language barriers and need help with like system navigation will be uh, provided by a promotora program. We still have our uh, Chromebooks. I think, I believe we have about 67 Chromebooks available to be loaned out to the community. Uh, we're creating the video modules, of course. Um, our language access and cultural competency initiative our proposal is complete. We're just waiting for DDS to give us a go signal so that we can input our proposal into the grant vantage system. And like Lori mentioned, the service access and equity policy was a um, stakeholder input process 
So we had folks group discussions with our community partners, our parents, and client advocates, and we use their input, their feedback for our service access and equity policy. So I'm gonna turn it over to Herman Kothi for the uh, POS data. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and this PowerPoint uh, will be posted on our website uh, under the same area uh, where we post the advertisement of this meeting. Uh, and because we do have email contacts for those who've registered, uh, we can include that as a handout that we send out. Uh, that's also where we will post and make available uh, access to the uh, recordings of uh, the English and Spanish uh, presentations of Monday and today's presentation. Um, so this slide is a hyperlink uh, to our raw POS data. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and put in the chat a link uh, since folks don't have the benefit of having the PowerPoint slide, uh, but this information is posted and available on our website and gives us the snapshot of where we are at. And by where we are at, uh, I do wanna mention, um, well, uh, first of all, a, a little information on what's included in this purchase of service data. Um, it is a 56 page document uh, and it's uh, data that gives us valuable information across broad demographic categories, uh, the ones that were established by the legislation as well as some more narrowly defined groupings of our population uh, that give us a little more detailed insight into specifics of how services are accessed when we begin examining age ranges uh, across uh, other cross sections of the demographics. Um, so on the next slide, I'll mention that uh, this data is always a look back, a retrospective, uh, through the looking glass in the rear view mirror of the period of time uh, that has passed uh, and captured in a prior fiscal year. That period being July 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. And as I mentioned Monday, I think it's important to remind ourselves what was going on during the entirety of that period. Uh, we saw some significant changes in the way that services were accessed and delivered in response to the global pandemic, the shelter in place, stay at home orders, uh, safety precautions. Uh, many in-person services had to shift to models of remote delivery uh, with program participation through virtual platforms, uh, which potentially impacted uh, access and equitability uh, based on access to technology and our reliance on technology to continue to deliver services. Uh, alternative services were the means by which uh, the state responded to ensuring that uh, there was something uh, as opposed to nothing available uh, to clients who needed services. Uh, and in absence of being able to deliver in-person services, uh, programs were able to modify their program designs to identify what they felt was best to continue uh, service delivery without interruption. Um, and regional centers were able to continue to support our provider community in uh, continuing to serve our population to keep them viable uh, and able to remain open uh, when we're able to resume services in person. Uh, that was an important, important uh, service delivery uh, decision uh, that was implemented uh, during this prior fiscal year. Uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, before we start looking at how POS dollars were spent, I think it's important to examine first who makes up the regional center population in Alta's 10 county catchment area. So this is a visual representation of the community that Alta serves, uh, displaying the different ethnicities in our population by total number as well as a percentage breakdown. And we'll use this graph as a side-by-side -side comparison against uh, percentages of dollars spent uh, to give some perspective. Um, I will share that uh, regional centers capture uh, client uh, demographic information of race and ethnicity uh, based on 22 different options. 
uh, but for purposes of examining uh, access in a sort of a meaningful, digestible, comprehensible manner, uh, those 22 ethnicities are categorized by the state into seven groups uh, for comparison. Uh, Asian Indian or Alaska Native, I'm sorry, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, uh, Black, African American, Hispanic, Native Hawaiian or Pacific or other Pacific Islander, uh, a grouping of other ethnicity or race uh, or multicultural. And that would include if people identify uh, as more than one category of uh, those 22 options for race or ethnicity and uh, the white population. On the next slide, uh, we see how Alta California Regional Center spent its purchase of service budget uh, during that prior fiscal year. Uh, we spent $456 million in accessing direct services for our client population. Uh, and this is a breakdown of how it was spent uh, numerically as well as uh, with percentages um, on the different categories of ethnicities we serve. Uh, the next slide puts those two pie graphs in a side-by-side -side comparison uh, where we look at on the left, uh, the percentage breakdown of the population we serve on the right, the percentage breakdown of how POS dollars were spent. And we do see uh, that there's clearly a stark contrast in how different populations access Alta services uh, with a significantly greater uh, proportion of POS dollars being spent on the white population, uh, which raises the question and deserves the answer, uh, why is that? Uh, which gives us the opportunity to dig in and begin to examine uh, some of that data on a more detailed level and figure out uh, what that information tells us about where we need to go and what we can work to improve. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide uh, we used in last year's, uh, and yes, uh, thank you, Nicole, for uh, capturing in the chat uh, some plain language uh, explanation of an expenditure, which is money spent, dollars that the regional center uh, spend. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation today, our service system was designed to be responsive to the needs of the communities we serve. And the way that we accomplish this is through developing and implementing uh, person-centered individual program plans. Uh, and for our zero to three population, the individualized family service plan that takes into account uh, the needs of the family system as a whole. Um, service delivery is designed to meet individual needs and as such uh, services are going to be provided at different levels to different individuals based on those assessed and identified needs uh, but our service system is also designed to support the achievement of individual goals and as much as i like the visual representation that this image provides uh, everyone in this image is receiving the support they need uh, but they're all striving for the same goal and overcoming the same barrier uh, they're, they're able to view the same thing and achieve that. Our service system is a bit more complex than this uh, visual representation uh, describes and has to take into account that not every person shares the same hopes and dreams for their preferred future. Uh, one of our primary goals that's included in every IPP that I've ever seen uh, is developing a plan that uh, looks at choosing where someone wants to live. Uh, on our next slide, uh, this is where we uh, deviated a bit from the uh, data provided by the state and looked at how Alta uh, dollars were spent. And looking at the top categories of services, um, this is broken down by service codes. And service codes are categorizations of types of services that Alta uh, purchases or buys with our POS budget, our purchase of service budget. And listing the top 10 categories, uh, we see that three of the top six, which account for 40% of our $450 million budget is spent on services that are provided specifically to support a client in living somewhere other than their family home. Uh, those services are 
uh, supported living services, uh, which require an individual uh, to be able to secure their own housing outside of uh, parental uh, living arrangement. Residential services, uh, which are the 24-7 residential care support provided by the regional center. Uh, and residential program support, which is enhanced staffing uh, that might be needed in addition to the base level provided by uh, the uh, ARM alternative residential model uh, rate that's established. Um, we also uh, see on the next slide, uh, the comparison by which uh, different populations by ethnicity access these services. And we see that for supported living, uh, there is a disproportionate access or use uh, of supported living uh, by the white community. On the next slide, we see residential services, uh, which again is uh, disproportionately accessed uh, by the white population, uh, whereas uh, diverse communities are not accessing uh, those services uh, to the same extent. Um, the next slide is that supplemental residential program support, the enhanced staffing that's provided in those residential settings. And those are three uh, of the uh, areas uh, that account for some of the greatest uh, regional center expenditures, 40% of our budget going towards uh, those three services. Uh, by contrast, still uh, among the top 10 uh, services accessed as a system, respite, which is the most common service, I would say, access to support a client to achieve their goal to remain successfully, safely in the family home. Uh, this accounts for about 8% of Alta's total overall budget uh, we do see a much more equitable distribution of service access uh, for this service um, when the goal is for clients to remain in their home. In fact, uh, we actually see a um, greater proportional access uh, used by the Hispanic community at 21% of uh, the use of respite services going towards that population, uh, which represents 18% of the total overall regional center population. Um, the raw data uh, that I shared and is available on our website uh, does give us the ability to examine uh, the use of services across age ranges. Uh, and the charts on the next slides uh, illustrate what we've sort of captured and converted to the $1 perspective. And in doing so, uh, what we did is look at per capita expenditures which are oftentimes in the thousands of dollar ranges. And we've just uh, converted that uh, to a dollar uh, comparison in order to uh, make, again, a more uh, comprehensible, digestible um, display of uh, a comparison of apples to apples, how dollars are spent across the different uh, ethnic populations. Um, uh, we included in each chart uh, as we go forward, uh, we'll stay here for now, but uh, on each of these charts, we'll see in the right column are uh, Alta's most recent fiscal year data uh, compared to in the column to the left, the middle column, uh, our data from the prior fiscal year. Uh, this will provide us a year over year comparison as to how things uh, might've changed from one year to the next. Uh, we've also included in these charts the statewide data on the uh, far left column, uh, California's uh, dollar perspective of how money was spent system-wide on uh, the various ethnic populations. Um, I'll share uh, that given these are averages uh, taken per capita calculations, um, and in most cases we do have fairly significant numbers of individuals served in each category. Uh, the hope would be uh, that the averages would uh, equate to a one-to-one -one correspondence that would reflect having achieved equity. Um, however, I will mention that we do have some populations in these uh, groupings categories who are minimally represented. Uh, and that means that um, changes in 
Uh, a few individuals could easily skew data and the means to address uh, disparity uh, might be a more targeted approach rather than um, a systemic uh, alteration. Uh, for instance, specifically uh, with the American Indian or Alaska Native population, Alta only has 134 clients total uh, that fit in that category. Uh, similarly, in the Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander uh, grouping, Alta serves only 132 clients to identify in that category. Um, so uh, we'll keep that in mind as we examine this data. Looking at this age range, our birth to two uh, clients served in our early intervention, early start program, accessing services from ages zero to three, uh, we do see a trend of greater equity uh, achieved uh, looking at the year over year comparison for this population uh, with the greatest disparity being recognized in the American Indian or Alaska Native population. Uh, 41 cents compared to uh, using the white population as the standard uh, dollar spent, uh, meaning we're spending 60% less on that population. Again, it is worth mentioning the number of individuals that we serve in that population uh, is made up of uh, only 16 children. So I, I'm not certain a uh, systemic multi uh, thousand million dollar grant project would be a solution versus a uh, more individualized targeted outreach approach um, to assess what's going on with uh, the needs and uh, the disparity in access for that population. On the next slide, uh, looking at the age range of clients ages three to 21, um, we do see uh, some changes, a significant drop off in the utilization by the Asian population and the native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander uh, communities compared to their respective use of services uh, in the birth to two year category. Um, both of those populations drop down to uh, under 70 cents on the dollar spent. Uh, the Asian population accessing 68 cents per dollar. Uh, the native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander only having 61 uh, cents on the dollar spent uh, for their population. Um, worth mentioning uh, for that Native Hawaiian Other Pacific Islander grouping, um, this population is made up of only 73 clients, uh, whereas the Asian population uh, in this category, uh, let me check quickly, um, has 1,500 clients. Uh, and it might be worth mentioning at this point. Um, I, I said we'd get into an explanation in the public comment period about uh, grant project proposals and grant project approvals. Um, and it's not ALTA that uh, dictates what grant proposals uh, should be put forth and what grant proposals get approved. Uh, it's really the data. Um, and in addition to the data, it's stakeholder input. So the two proposals that Alta put forth this grant cycle year were an enhanced rate for uh, early intervention uh, services, uh, for services delivered outside of a traditional uh, nine to five Monday to Friday schedule, as well as uh, an additional uh, language and access uh, outreach position. Um, and those proposals were based on input and feedback we received from last year's annual POS uh, data meeting. And when we look at the projects that were awarded, were approved, um, those are decisions that are made by the department. Um, and any community-based organization can put forth whatever they believe to be a meaningful uh, grant project um, based on the data that's available to the public. And then it's at the department's discretion to identify um, what the best projects to serve the community uh, would be going forward. Um, so if we advance to the next slide, 
Uh, on this slide, we're looking at our population of adults and uh, adults who have aged out of the school system, who are looking at uh, finding things other than education uh, to be um, contributing meaningfully and productively to their communities. Uh, and we do see a significant drop off uh, in the use by our Asian and Native Hawaiian, or, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that was the previous slide. Um, so uh, this is where the greatest disparities exist in the regional center systems population um, with a significant drop off compared to white counterparts of access to services. And this is accounted for to some extent by the disproportionate access of services designed to support clients in moving out of the family home. Um, Alta's data does seem consistent uh, compared with statewide trends on the column to the uh, far left. Uh, we also see that the data in this age range has not changed significantly uh, from one year to the next, comparing this year's or most recent fiscal year's data with the prior. We do have the ability with the raw data that was provided uh, on the next slide to factor out uh, from the equation, the purchase of service dollars that were spent uh, to access residential services. Um, so this looks at, and I'll share with you uh, the page that you can find this on the 56 pages of raw data. On page 46, POS expenditures, POS dollars spent, are examined uh, based on living arrangements uh, broken down by the ethnic population. And page 46 looks at clients of the regional center who are living in what's described as the home environment. And that would be the home of family relative or guardian. Um, and when we carve out uh, the um, numbers and the dollars spent on clients who are accessing exclusively supports to live in uh, residential settings other than the family home, uh, we do see significant improvement in equitable access. Uh, however, recognizably, uh, some disparity does still exist, and that's where we need to continue uh, to work to improve uh, and come up with ideas on how to address that. Um, on the next slide, we sort of throw all the ages back into the same category, uh, but we've again carved out the uh, adult clients who are living in residential settings other than the family home and the dollars spent. Uh, and when we look across all age ranges, um, we see that there's been some improvement in the service access and equity uh, compared to the previous year's uh, data. Um, although this data does illustrate that uh, disparity of services used grows as clients enter adulthood and much more significantly as clients transition from their family home, uh, as I mentioned, it also identifies some disparity that exists prior to adulthood and even when services uh, accessed is examined uh, looking just at clients who live at home. Uh, the next slide shows a graphic representation of that. Um, so we'll pause here for a second. Uh, this is a slide that we've seen before, and this is just to refresh everybody's memory, looking at the overall regional center population and the overall uh, regional center purchases, dollars spent, and the disparity that exists um, with uh, doing the math quickly in my head, 16% more uh, spent on the white population uh, compared to the proportion that it represents. On the next slide, having taken out the residential services, we see that that disparity drops. It still exists, uh, still needs to be addressed, uh, still needs to be examined uh, why it exists and how we can improve it. Um, but uh, it does reflect uh, um, improvement uh, compared to uh, previous years. If we go back uh, looking historically five years ago at the same measure, uh, looking at purchase of service dollars 
and next slide will show us uh, fiscal year 2015 2016 so this was five years ago um, the percentage of clients living in family home and the uh, percentage of POS dollars spent on that population um, still uh, disproportionate uh, for the examination of dollars spent on the white population, uh, but we have seen some improvement in that area uh, looking at this year's fiscal data. Uh, the next slide is just a quote uh, that uh, inspires me and keeps me uh, vigilant on the work that we need to do. Uh, we know that this process is a journey and change doesn't happen overnight. Uh, we know that we still have work to do. Uh, there will never be a finish line uh, because even if equity is achieved statistically, we'll always need to remain attentive uh, to ensure that access uh, remains equitable for all. Um, and with that, uh, the most, again, important part of this entire process is the ideas that come from the community that we serve. Um, and to get people thinking, and in all honesty, to kind of force people uh, to begin thinking about uh, what input they'd like to share in public comment, uh, we would invite you to participate in a poll uh, that's embedded in this uh, presentation. Uh, so I'll ask Helen as the host to go ahead and launch that poll and I'll read the question aloud and we'll give some time for a response. So the first question we're asking is, what do you think are the greatest barriers impacting access to Alta services? And uh, we have a Spanish translation of that. And you can select as many responses as you like. Uh, it's multiple choice. We came up with some that we've heard from uh, previous community input, lack of technology, uh, language barriers, cultural barriers, uh, scheduling difficulties in accessing uh, services that are authorized, geographic isolation that might exist in metropolitan versus rural areas that we serve across our 10 county catchment area, uh, lack of transportation if services are something that are provided at a location, a site, and again, people are uh, in remote settings or uh, struggle to access transportation. So we'll uh, allow some time for people to read through the question, read through the uh, possible responses. And looks like uh, we've got about 56% uh, of folks having responded at this point. Um, we'll allow maybe 15 more seconds for people to make sure their feedback is captured. Your responses are anonymous. We won't know who said what, uh, but the aggregate data is something that will be available to us and could be beneficial to us moving forward. So I thank you for your attention and participation to this. We're up to 65%. Maybe sharing that it was anonymous uh, gave people more uh, confidence in responding. Um, so the poll's been open for just under two minutes. We're at 65%. Uh, and at the two minute mark, I think we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results so people can see what the, the percentages of respondents were. So it looks like uh, the lead with 80% uh, was uh, the belief that cultural barriers pose uh, a barrier to accessing regional center services. Um, and I'll uh, go ahead and share uh, that regional centers are developing uh, implicit bias training uh, for all regional centers. Uh, DDS is uh, working for a consistent training across the state and Alta is committed to uh, building in uh, training in that area as well. Uh, language barriers uh, seem to be a close second, uh, but Everything got uh, at least some votes. Uh, so um, a widespread uh, approach to addressing these is probably what's needed. Uh, Helen, if we wanna stop sharing, I think everybody has the ability to uh, view and close their own screen of viewing those poll results. 
On our second poll question that we invite you to participate, uh, we're asking you to begin thinking about uh, solutions, areas that regional centers can work to address these barriers, to eliminate barriers, to improve access. So if we wanna go ahead and launch that poll, and I will again, read the question aloud. Uh, how would you propose Alta uh, to work on improving service access and equity? Uh, is the solution uh, training Alta staff, uh, developing training for our service providers, uh, develop uh, resources for ethnically diverse communities? Is it uh, resource development? Uh, enhanced outreach to community partners? Uh, do we need to um, work to schedule more uh, meetings to connect uh, with those groups that help us uh, reach diverse populations and communities, or uh, enhancing education and information uh, to share directly uh, with those diverse populations that we serve. So we're up to almost 50% uh, response rate on this poll question. And I think we'll allow the same two minute time frame for information to be shared. And it looks like we're just shy of 60% uh, response rate with about 15 seconds left on the poll. So if you'd like to begin making your final selections. And we're up to 66% and that's uh, two minutes. So I think we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And a fairly uh, even uh, disbursement of responses uh, with training, uh, developing training for providers, uh, developing new resources, uh, enhanced outreach to community partners, and enhanced education and information sharing. Um, so I think we can close the poll results. Uh, we appreciate that feedback. Again, that's helpful. And this was intended as an activity uh, to just get your minds thinking about uh, the barriers that exist and the methods and means that we might work to overcome those barriers as a system. Um, as Lori mentioned at the beginning, uh, Alta's adoption of our service access and equity policy uh, is committed to uh, our future efforts continuing to involve stakeholder feedback and collaboration on grant activities uh, designed to create innovative services and supports. So we've reached the point in the meeting where we encourage people to unmute microphones, ask questions, share comments. Uh, this will be not your one and only chance, uh, but a great opportunity to share uh, ideas with us on where you'd like us to go in the future. Um, I'd like to... Um introduce uh, Steve Rusis. He is uh, from Love. Uh, Love is the English translation of that word, Monk Center. So Steve, would you like to say something? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Helen. This was great to see. Uh, yeah, we're in Merced and uh, I'm part of Blue Monk Center. Uh, we began in 2010 and our, our goal is to try to address um, system level changes with uh, around disparities and, and working in partnership with public institutions. And so we're thrilled to be part of this uh, next rank cycle. We've been working with CVRC since 2018. 
And um, we've got a lot to learn as everyone's pointing out with the data. So we're glad to be here. I think one thing we're, um, we're gonna try with this grant cycle, which we've done over the last three years is um, providing more opportunities for practice. We see a lot of the disparities that exist as um, challenges in all of us, not just staff and service providers, but in community members. We don't have a chance to practice with each other. You wouldn't go out there and try to be a professional soccer player or a professional violinist if you don't practice. And um, we just don't have a lot of opportunities for that. And hopefully we'll have a chance to provide that with our, with our grant. So thank you, it'll be fun. Okay, thank you, Steve. So we are now going to, to address the questions that are in the chat if they haven't been answered yet. Uh, so, uh, so any deaf participants confirm for this event? Uh, I think we have Rima in this event. And, okay. And uh, Nicole, again, the presentation for Monday was recorded, so that would be available uh, for you. Herman, are we posting those recording on the I, YouTube? Yes, we will uh, upload them to YouTube and create links uh, on the website uh, for people to view those. Okay. And... Um, for K Medina, two additional CBOs have been added since Monday. Uh, in on Monday's presentation, I did mention that we had uh, two others that were not listed because I said that we haven't made connections with them yet. While well, the ones that were listed, the four, we already had connections with them as far as uh, the plans for what's gonna happen in the upcoming, uh, the uh, implementation of the project. And... Yeah, the decision to highlight uh, CBOs and uh, partner with them in uh, today and Monday's meeting um, was to highlight the partnerships that exist in the community. And if we invited all four uh, for each, uh, would have been a little more time consuming um, and we might not have had the time to get to the review of the POS data and the public uh, input uh, from stakeholders. Uh, so we did two on Monday and two today. And on the question about the efforts that are made to address the needs of the Black and Hispanic communities, again, uh, I will reiterate that the Service Navigator Program targeted African-American, Hispanic, and Slavic. And we wanted to target the Hmong community, but we couldn't hire a Hmong Service Navigator. Uh, previous efforts, such as workshops, enhanced respite, all targeted Hispanic and African-American communities. And it, you can see um, on the data that Herman presented, uh, there was actually improvement in terms of uh, dollars spent uh, for these uh, communities. And Nicole, on the question of uh, POS expenditures, yeah, that, that is uh, expenditures. Let me see. Would any of you want to unmute yourself and um, ask your questions? I was wondering on the data where you broke down the top, I think 10 expenditures, um, translation wasn't on there. Was that, does it fit into the others or was it not even included in that information? Uh, translation is included in the others. It's just not in the top 10 that were represented as the most um, money spent, yeah but it is included in the data. Okay, so there is a, um, either a comment or a question. If answering 
some of these questions can be helpful for the audience to understand the data being shared. I think it would be important to have it answered as we go, especially clarifying questions. That was a feedback, okay. And Kelsey answered that. Uh, do we have information on the ethnic makeup of ALTA staff? You know, we we usually provide that. I'll, I'll answer that, yeah. Okay. We do. And I have it right here. I look at it quarterly. Um, and, uh, and I make certain that we are in line with representing the um, complexion and reflection of the community served. Uh, and so that's something that we're constantly looking at when we put forward our hiring plans. All right. So education requirements for Alta staff, um, Bachelor uh, Herman or Lori or Michelle, would you like to address that? Yes, yeah, certainly. This is Michelle. Um, we are looking for applicants that have a bachelor or a master's degree in social work or a related field. So um, to answer the question, what are the educational requirements, bachelor or master's degree? All right. Uh, Steve said a learning together approach may be wise too. Sometimes staff, service providers, and community members need more opportunities to learn together, not train in isolation of each other. Thank you, Steve, for the feedback. Um, I'll just share. I just uh, pulled, um, again, outside of what's available in the raw data um, required by the state, Alta's. Uh, purchase of service categories, the percentage of our $450 million budget that's spent on translator or interpreter services uh, is 0.2%. Uh, it's about 1 million and change of a, um, uh, the state data reports a $450, $450 million uh, expenditure. Um, there's some, uh, other sort of contract uh, purchases like for transportation um, that are included in our raw data. Uh, so those are difficult to incorporate into the statewide data because they aren't uh, tied to an individual client. Um, they're paid uh, based on a contract um, and the bus doesn't really calculate uh, the ethnicity of the individuals it picks up, it just uh, runs its route and picks up the people along that route that are needed. So transportation is a big purchase of service expenditure that's paid on a contract basis uh, that's hard to carve out um, the um, individuals specifically accessing that. Um, and uh, a comment, the poll that was just conducted is an example of how data is collected with more than half of the participants on the Zoom being Alta staff, how does the data that you just collected fairly represent stakeholder input? Earlier, Herman stated that the data dictates potential grant opportunities and helps the regional center focus on where the need is. Herman, would you like to address that? Yeah, um, we're happy that our staff are present. Uh, we believe that their input is valued as well. Um, that poll data isn't uh, going to drive grant projects um, so much as inspire conversation during this public stakeholder period where people are encouraged to unmute their microphones and share with us. Um, we'll also uh, continue to accept input and feedback uh, beyond today's meeting. Uh, we have a Outlook email address uh, set up, uh, POS equity at altaregional.org, uh, where we'll continue to take uh, input. Um, yeah, the data that I was referring to that drives uh, grant project submissions and approvals is the POS data uh, that was shared in the initial link. Um, 
All right, and Maureen said, I would urge, I'll try to put up the number. So uh, numbers at its website on the ethnic makeup of Alta staff. So uh, that's probably a decision for the management to do, but that's a, a comment. And Kay Medina said that we have all just experienced how the data can be skewed to tip the needle in your favor. I think, uh, and Herman may also um, address this, but I think the data is the data. I mean, what was published, uh, again, it's on that POS data um, that's published uh, online. That's where we got our uh, data. Yeah, the data will uh, take into account the composition uh, of the group. We do know uh, based on email addresses of registrants, uh, the percentage of Alta staff uh, and those that would be uh, community members. Um, and if it's a 50-50 makeup, um, then the data would reflect the source of that information coming from half employees and half community members. Uh, but again, this is the opportunity for community to share their uh, individual input uh, that will be valued just as much as poll results. And uh, again, the polls were almost a tool designed to get people thinking about uh, those two very important questions. So um, from Brianne, do ACRC staff receive, receive a list of vendors that support certain languages? As a vendor, we offer services in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, and our referrals for Spanish and Vietnamese are low to none. So uh, my guess is that st staff may not know a one sheet could be helpful so families whose primary languages of Spanish and Vietnamese could know we can provide that support. And we have John Decker here, who is the, uh, our director for community services and, and support. And I'm sure that we can address that. For Harisha Willis, who, who do I contact for the ACRC videos? I have a few clients that would participate. That would be me. Um, let me see. So I'm just typing my information. And yes, we would appreciate it so much. Thank you, Harisha. Dictionary at autoregional.org. All right. I think it could maybe be helpful to quarterly send to the vendors a question about what languages you can support, because that changes very frequently as they hire and lose staff. So, I mean, I know at my organization, we speak, we have people that speak many different languages, but any given month, one might leave and a new one come in. So it might be helpful to just be getting that information quarterly from all of the vendors. Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent point, Nicole. Let me interject here. This is Lori. Um, working with our provider advisory committee, uh, they have a subcommittee uh, on diversity, service access, and equity, uh, and they have been uh, launching a pool uh, out to the vendor uh, community. They started with representatives that um, are seated on the advisory committee, as well as those members uh, that come and just join in the meeting uh, to get a reflection of what that survey um, would look like, what the response rate would be, and if the data was meaningful. And my understanding is, is their intention to move that out uh, to all vendors so that we could have an accurate and ongoing reflection of the uh, languages and uh, culturals that are supported uh, within each of the vendor communities. So um, that's something that's just well on, underway and hopefully will be very uh, meaningful and useful to our service coordinators and community. And from Jasmine uh, Wallace, are we looking for feedback from actual Alta, Alta clients? If we are, how are we effectively uh, getting their feedback? Um, Oh, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to let everyone know in this group that 
at the end of this meeting, there is a survey. Uh, the, it's a yes or no uh, questions. There's about four of them. And we plan to continue the discussions on service access and equity ongoing. So any anybody who is interested in uh, participating in that discussion, um, I welcome you guys to uh, put your email address on the survey. There's a question, I think question number four, that asks for your email addresses. I think it's, it's a good idea to continue this discussion because it's, it's an evolving uh, topic. And um, to answer that question, we also, um, we also uh, ask our client advocates, we have two now, uh, that are uh, employed by Alta to gather feedback, or um, if we need groups for focus group discussions, the client advocates will typically um, recruit some members, Alta clients in the community. Additionally, Helen, we have um, a very robust group of uh, client individuals that are seated yes. on our client advisory committee. Uh, and their advisory committee to the board. And we take uh, various topic discussions to them uh, to address and to generate uh, feedback uh, and input. Yes. Thank you, Lori. All right. I just want to take this opportunity to say that this is one point in time where we engage with the community uh, on the, you know, the topic of of disparity and ways in which uh, our regional center can address, um, you know, the way forward uh, in making a mark and as it's often referred to as moving that needle uh, back to, um, you know, equity. We are committed to doing that. As I'd indicated at the front end, you know, we've got this policy that is really um, setting at the foundation for our regional center to move forward and looking through the lens of equity and ways that we can ensure uh, that we're doing the best we can for the people we serve uh, in all of the communities that are um, represented. Uh, we really are asking for input, whether it be in today's meeting or ongoing. We've got the email uh, address where people can um, you know, pop in some ideas. Uh, we look at all of those uh, ideas that come forward to help us plan on the way forward. Uh, we also have through um, recent trailer bill language that came through in current budget year, uh, the low to no purchase of service um, caseloads. So they're enhanced caseloads of one to 40, where we have individuals that are uh, members of communities that we've identified through our data, uh, where we can invite them to a caseload of one to 40 and have someone who speaks the language and uh, is part of the culture uh, to help people to understand what services are available and walk them through linkage to generic resources as well. We're building those caseloads. We were um, allocated six caseloads uh, by the Department of Developmental Services in this current budget year, and we are populating those um, as we hire uh, individuals. Uh, the question was asked earlier, what are what is ALTA doing to address, um, you know, the inequities uh, with the Hispanic population as well as those uh, that are African American. We have two um, Hispanic, uh, Spanish speaking, uh, low to no purchase of service caseloads as well as uh, African American caseloads that we're populating uh, to do a very concerted effort. We additionally have, as Helen had mentioned, the service navigator program that is um, housed at the Warmline Family Resource Center that continues to address uh, the services uh, in the, the inequities uh, across different populations. Those are continuing, uh, as well as this current budget year, the, um, the state has uh, embraced the opportunity to roll out a more robust navigator program, which is um, getting a, all of the regulations around it. Uh, it will also be implemented through uh, the Family Resource Centers, and they will be looking at uh, disparate uh, populations as well to enhance um, purchase of service and you know, all around support. 
Uh, there's a lot of different things that are going on, and we really uh, we cannot underscore the importance of getting feedback from our community. Um, what happens in these meetings is just one opportunity. Helen spends the, the large part of her year uh, engaging with specific focus groups uh, so that she can get information. She'll bring forward questions that help to generate the conversation. She goes out into the community and works with the populations uh, in, in areas where they feel comfortable. And so I just don't want for people to think that because of the one and a half hour that we had today that focused on you know real discrete uh, opportunities it is not a full reflection of everything that's being done uh, again though uh, the purpose of this meeting and going forward is to elicit that feedback we would really love to get some really specific ideas uh, that you all may have uh, to help us address the needs that are important to you all right so it's 12.02 um we have a recording of the chat so uh, i'll go over them after the meeting and again don't forget to uh, complete the survey thank you everyone